I'd like to introduce Esther Kaplan, who's going to be our moderator for tonight. She's a radio and print journalist, editor of the Investigative Fund at the Nation Institute, and co-host of Beyond the Pale, which covers <laughs> Jewish culture and politics on WBAI in New York. It's really wonderful that everyone came out on this chilly night to have this conversation. We're now at a point when, with very rare exceptions, such as the rockets being fired into southern Israel from Gaza, violent tactics have been renounced. Nonviolent forms of protest are on the rise, many of them featuring Israelis and Palestinians working side by side, such as video projects documenting abuse at checkpoints, the Gaza flotillas, and peaceful protests of the destruction of Palestinian homes and orchards in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. This is a welcome development, and the boycott sanctions and divestment movement is, in a sense, just another tool for a movement seeking out nonviolent tactics to force the end of the occupation and bring about an economically viable and politically independent Palestinian state. And yet, even though we're talking about an indisputably nonviolent tactic, discussion of a boycott has been nearly taboo within the Jewish community, stirring up anger at times, and at times even venom. And so I hope we can all take a moment before we begin to applaud Rabbi Lippmann and the Kolot Chayinu community for your bravery in hosting this, this discussion tonight. I think it signals a deep commitment to the Jewish values of discussion and debate that have been abandoned so often around this issue. Our panel tonight features three talented artists and three activists who represent a diversity of opinion on the question. We'd especially like to thank two of the artists. As Carol said, they're both members of Kolot Hainu for joining us tonight. Um, Lynn Sachs on my right whose recent experimental films include Sound of a Shadow and The Task of a Translator, and musician Roy Nathanson, whose bands have included Sada Voce and The Jazz Passengers. Uh, the third artist on our panel, to my immediate right, Uli Aloni, is an Israeli filmmaker whose best-known feature film is Forgiveness. Uli asks your forgiveness because he just flew in and is completely jet lagged. So if you see his eyes droop shut, it is not a sign of inattention, but meditation. Um, the activists on the panel uh, to on the, my far left are Dalit Baum of Who Profits, which is an economic boycott group that targets corporations directly profiting from the Israeli occupation. Jethro Eisenstein, who's on the board of directors of the national group Jewish Voice for Peace and has kindly offered to open up our discussion. And to my immediate left, Ron Skolnick, executive director of Merits USA, uh, an affiliate of the Israeli political party now known as Partners for Progressive Israel. Right? Uh, we also owe special thanks specifically to Udi and to Dalit for participating tonight in the face of a new law passed in July by the Israeli Knesset, which opens up any Israeli who speaks publicly in support of a boycott to potentially crippling lawsuits and the denial of government funds. So I think we should applaud their bravery as well. Our focus tonight is the cultural boycott in particular though there are many elements of the boycott effort. Uh, scattered international efforts date back earlier, but its formal origins, for those who don't know, lie with a group called PACB, the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, which was launched in Ramallah in 2004. Uh, they have very detailed guidelines about what this means, which are available on the back table or on their website, pacbi.org. But I will try briefly to summarize the approach. Uh, the focus is on the boycott of work commissioned by the Israeli government and the boycott of cultural and academic institutions and artist tours supported by the Israeli government. It calls on academics abroad to engage in divestment from Israel in their own academic institutions. 
and for academics and cultural figures abroad to decline to perform or speak at government-funded Israeli cultural or academic institutions. Individual Israeli artists who do not receive government funding are not subject to the boycott. Uh, cultural products, uh, sorry, cultural projects, well, and products associated with something called brand Israel are also targets of the boycott. Since the goal of that multi-million dollar Israeli government campaign, according to one top foreign ministry official, is to quote, show Israel's prettier face so we are not thought of purely in the context of war. In other words, the hope on the part of Israeli officials is that Israeli cultural production will distract foreign audiences from associating Israel with the occupation of Palestinian lands and replace those images with prettier, more pleasant associations. Thus, Brand Israel's installation one day, a couple years ago, of a Tel Aviv beach in the middle of Central Park. Um, it's against this backdrop of this effort that we need to understand the question of a cultural boycott. And of course, at this stage, the cultural boycott is more than just an idea. In recent years, we've seen picketing at a performance at BAM of Ohad Naharin's Bat Sheva Dance Company because it receives funding from Israeli government sources, including the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which has called Bat Sheva the best-known global ambassador of Israeli culture. A protest of a special Tel Aviv showcase at the Toronto Film Festival a couple years ago that was linked to Brand Israel. Protests in six cities outside of performance of the Israeli Philharmonic and the disruption of one concert in London because of the orchestra's close ties to the Israeli state and its role as an Israeli cultural ambassador. We've seen the refusal of Turkish and Swedish national soccer teams to play in Israel in the wake of Israel's armed attack on a Gaza flotilla last year. And we've seen the refusal of American and British bands such as the Pixies and Massive Attack to play in Israel. Perhaps some of these examples can serve as touchstones or jumping off points for our discussion tonight. I suspect all of us in this room dream of the day when the occupation is a thing of the past. But we all know that wishful thinking isn't enough. So the question is, how do we get there? What kinds of international pressure will make a difference. Numerous tactics have been attempted over the course of the 44-year-old occupation, and meanwhile, yet another generation is born under occupation. Clearly, we have to think bigger. It is to everyone's credit here tonight that we've committed to seriously discussing one aspect of that question, which is whether to engage in this significant new nonviolent tactic of cultural boycott. And with that, I will turn over the mic to Jethro Eisenstein. I told my cousin Anne, who's a member of Kalot, uh, that I was going to be on this panel tonight discussing cultural boycott. Her response was, oi, good luck, <laughs> which pretty much captures how I feel. I want to stress that what I have to say tonight about cultural boycott is, for better or for worse, my very own. But in order to provide context for my remarks, I want to spend a minute of my precious seven minutes telling you about the organization in which I'm active and about the position we have taken. I'm a member of the board of Jewish Voice for Peace, a national organization dedicated to democracy, self-determination, and a just peace for all peoples in Israel and Palestine. We believe Israel must end its 44-year illegal military occupation of Palestinian territories. We also believe all of Israel's citizens deserve equal rights and privileges, and that a durable peace cannot be had without a just solution for Palestinian refugees based on principles established in international law. To achieve these ends, JVP has become part of the global movement for boycott, disinvestment, and sanctions. We have done this after concluding that urging our government to become an agent for change is ineffective. BDS is about using economic power and personal action as leverage. It's an opportunity for each of us personally to act on our values and to express directly our views our support for just peace in Israel and Palestine. The BDS movement in all its variety can create, is creating the pressure that will eventually create conditions where negotiations can work. We in JVP have chosen to focus our efforts on boycott and disinvestment campaigns that directly target the occupation and the blockade of Gaza. 
we think that, J for, that this is the best way for JVP to respond to the Palestinian call for all people of conscience to use nonviolent means to pressure Israel to be accountable under, un, under international law. <clears throat> we reject the assertion that BDS is anti-Semitic, and we are prepared to defend activists around the world who are wrongly demonized or accused of anti-Semitism based on their participation in boycott activities. I want to uh, make some general points that inform my view on cultural boycott. First, I think that the comparison with South Africa is imperfect at best for two reasons. Israel, unlike South Africa's apartheid government, has major allies in its midst, uh, and the apartheid government did not have the enormous club of anti-Semitism to wield. Our alliances, in addition, with other activists, Christian and Jewish, would be undermined if we took a position for some kinds of cultural boycott. I recognize that while giving weight to these considerations may put me at odds with the Palestinian call, I have to point out that I am working, so to speak, my side of the street. And if I add value to the struggle, it is in knowing what will work on my side of the street. Cultural boycott possibilities are as many and as varied as cultural interactions, and I think they have to be addressed separately. The easiest case for me is all boycotts that originate in Israel. Uh, for example, JVP supported the refusal of artists last September to perform in uh, Ariel and marshaled a whole group of American artists in their support. Another easy call is support for the boycott of the Ariel University Center. 165 university professors, many in the hard sciences, have signed a pledge refusing to teach or lecture at Ariel. But one has to bear in mind the words of the initiator of this call, near Gov of the Weizmann Institute. He said, Israeli academia must differentiate itself from the settlement academia. Only significant differentiation can help our supporters abroad who are working against an academic boycott of Israel. So even in there, there's, it seems to me, enormous complexity. <clears throat> Trying to persuade artists from outside Israel not to perform in Israel. I understand the goal of the boycott is to show Israel that its policies have consequences. But there's a compelling argument to be made that when an artist goes to Israel and insists on acknowledging the Palestinian cause, it can help bring about change. Ian McEwen went to Israel to accept the Jerusalem Prize and used his acceptance speech to excoriate Israel for the occupation and contributed his prize money to the organization Combatants for Peace. I think we should support artists, academics, and others who choose this route of confronting Israeli audiences about the occupation. At the same time, we should support artists who refuse to perform in Israel, publicize and explain their stance, and affirm that they do this not out of anti-Semitism, but out of concern for human rights. Boycotting Israel, Israeli performing artists coming to the US. The Israeli uh, Philharmonic Orchestra is clearly part of the rebranding campaign, and I think that boycotting and picketing the IPO is appropriate and effective. <coughs> It requires people to be mindful of the occupation. <clears throat> the moral of this story for me is that Israel is the most powerful military state in the region by orders of magnitude, but presents itself frequently as a victim and has what someone has described as an insatiable need for loving affirmations. <laughs> when I consider having an impact on such a collective psyche, if I can call it that, I have to conclude that an absolutist, absolutist view of boycotts may not be the most effective. If refusing to go facilitates Israel's self-view as victim, sometimes it may be better to go and use an opportunity to speak <coughs> truth to power. When considering actions of this kind, I don't see a divergence between moral and strategic considerations. Our moral obligation is to be as effective as possible. I, if I have one more minute, I, I want to mention the, uh, the disruption of the, uh, of the IPO uh, uh, performance in, in London uh, a couple of weeks ago. I had a strong, visceral, negative reaction to that, which I'm trying, as they say, to unpack. Uh, I'm willing to acknowledge that part of my response is an outsized, naive belief or hope that people coming together to make or listen to music should be permitted to do so outside of politics. But part of my response is a legitimate political reaction based on what I understand to be JVP's continuing effort to, so to speak, stay in the room with Jews who are to the right of us. 
make sure they are able to hear us. I think people coming to listen to the IPO by and large do not experience themselves as engaged in politics and I think that they may be deeply offended by the disruption, may view the performers as bravely carrying on, and because of what they view as an attenuated connection between the music they are hearing and the policies of the government of Israel are likely to view the disruption not as anti-government policies, but as something more sinister. Thank you. This is Lynn Sachs. Hello. I speak to you as an artist, a filmmaker, and a member of Kolot Shayanu. Sometimes I ask myself why being a Jew, and I distinguish this from being born Jewish, has always been such a political act. For me, the intellectual issues that stir inside me and force me to contemplate my own belief structure are part and parcel of what I see as my dilemma of faith. Rarely do I ask myself whether I believe in God or the value of a cosmic prayer in a moment of wonder or tragedy. There is no one to whom I must prove either of these personal qualities, for it is in this constant position of ambiguity that I find religion, per se, to transcend my simple being, where it allows me to confront who I am at the most fundamental level. So it is with candor and passion that I address that third frustratingly public aspect of our identities as Jews. In November 2002, I sat down to breakfast and opened the New York Times. I read the story of Revital Ohayon, a mother, a filmmaker, and a teacher. All but one quality I shared with her. Ohayon had made the brave, tragic choice to live with her two young sons in Kibbutz Metzer, a widely known kibbutz with a history of warm, friendly relations with the Palestinian village just on the other side of a rather porous barbed wire fence. The children played together. Business was conducted. For Ohayan, setting up her home near, almost with, this Arab village gave her the opportunity, opportunity to live out a personal politics of peace and mutual understanding. Several days before I read this article, Israeli tractors had bulldozed homes in Jenin, a nearby Palestinian town. Anger and the desire for some form of retaliation spread across the region. One man with a gun walked into Revital's kibbutz with the intention of killing. Revital and her two sons were murdered as she spoke on the phone to her husband, describing what was happening to her in her own home. When I read Revital's story, I decided I needed to know why she had chosen to live in that place, why her sense of being a Jew and a cultural work, worker necess necessitated this kind of risk. The film I made on her life and on the conflict is called States of Unbelonging. It is an essay in the form of a film where I ask questions about our relationship to land, <clears throat> to land history, and Jewish Palestinian Palestinian identity. Now, almost a decade after Revital's death, I still feel compelled to pay homage to those people who choose to take risks for the things that they believe. In this light, I contemplate my own possible return to Israel-Palestine as a second chance to examine and celebrate the choices she made. In this way, these complex, non-didactic cultural experiences can give local audiences the opportunity to engage with the artwork and to begin a dialogue that could possibly open up the society to renewed compassion for peace and coexistence. By traveling with our art and conducting non-agenda-based conversations with our audiences in both Israel and the occupied territories, I believe that we can engender new ways of thinking and living. For this reason, I do not advocate unilateral cultural boycotts of either Israel or the Palestinian territories. I have to speak differently than what I thought I will speak, and it's good I never write what I'm speaking about so I can change it right now. So I'm an artist. I just finished to do a big project for me 
maybe small project for the world, but uh, we did uh, Waiting for Godot with the students from Janine Refugee Camp. And <laughs> that all of them are students of my dearest friend, uh, Giuliano Merhamis, that has been uh, murdered. And the quality of his teaching was the only reason I could handle those students and did this Waiting for Godot. And um, I think this is a big symbol of a dialogue and I'm a big advocate for cultural boycott. So I want to speak about BDS and cultural boycott from theological Jewish point of view. I think that as a Jew, as a Jew that lives in Israel, the only way I can perform my Jewishness is with full solidarity with the Palestinian people. Um, I believe in a dialogue only when you show solidarity with the one that is the victim. I'm not, when you said I don't want to boycott Israel and Palestine, as, as like the same, for me sometimes it's like when people ask to do dialogue, equal dialogue between Israel and Palestine today, it sometimes feels like making a dialogue between rapists and women that has been raped. That's how I feel about it. And it's hard feeling, but that's the way I feel about it. So in order to create a true dialogue, first the Palestinians have to have sovereignty. And then we can have this equal dialogue. BDS for me is a way to give sovereignty to the one who doesn't have sovereign. I feel, and I want to give a very specific example. I have a book coming soon uh, in Columbia University Press, and it's called What Does a Jew Want? on Binationalism and Other Specters. And according to the new law in Israel, probably the book that Columbia now publishes is an illegal book. It's another question to ask about Israel. But I I uh, wanted to sh share this book with my friends in Tel Aviv because I want you to understand that if I joined the boycott, the cultural boycott in Israel was when I had a lot of anger to my fellow Tel Aviv people because it was on uh, the Gaza attack when Israel continued to celebrate Tel Aviv, celebrating with indifferent. Today I'm joining the BDS with my love to Tel Aviv because there is something precious that happened right now in Tel Aviv. Maybe not everyone understands it. Maybe many Palestinians righteously feel that it's very eudocentric, this revolution. But there are young people who are fighting capitalism in Tel Aviv. And I hope that using the BDS, I can move them to this place of understanding that justice is justice is justice. Mm -hmm. And when our fellow friends, and you know, people who don't join cultural boycott, I can understand them. I'm not go to war against them. Really, yeah, I understand oh, it. But when you spoke about Arie, I, I want just about why I mentioned my book. So it was very important for me to share this book with my friends in uh, Tel Aviv. I'm spending most of my time, I spent recently in uh, Janine and Ramallah, and I brought to help to teach uh, Slavoj Zizek and James Shemos to teach in Ramallah. And I didn't care if they support BDS or not. I asked them to follow the rules of BDS. That's all I asked. And they agree. And then I came to Omar Burguti, that is the one of the people that from Pavki that you see all the rules there. And I told him, Omar, but I want to speak about my book with my friends in uh, Tel Aviv, and I would like Slavo Zizek to come with me and help me to promote it. And Omar was very clear about it. He said, if it's not a governmental institution, if they this place, the venue, will claim that he is against the occupation and it uh, agree that uh, Palestinians have equal rights according to the international law, it's okay with me. And we did, by following BDS rule, have Slavoj Zizek coming to Tel Aviv to a place that doesn't get money from the Israel government. Boycott, it is really about a true dialogue, dialogue that agree to understand that we do dialogue only with people that follow the rules of equality between people and people who refuse apartheid in any way and form. Now, the issue of Ariel is very important to mention it. The people that follow Ariel, they do cultural boycott. It's very clear. Now, the question, where is the source of the occupation? I think the source of the occupation are not the settlers. 
The settlers has been sent by the place that hold the money, that gave the money, and the center of Israel is Tel Aviv. So as long as there is occupation, in the center of Tel Aviv University, there is a village, Sheikh Munes, that Sharet, the most dove leader of Israel, promised this village that they will go back to their village. Israel destroyed this village and built a university there. Now, if one day, inshallah, we'll have peace, either as a one state, the way I believe it, or two states, as other people believe it, I'm not choosing the dialogue. And then there is kind of re reconciliation. I believe that it will be okay that Tel Aviv University will act finally. But right now, if there is no, the name Palestine doesn't exist. Everyone said Israel-Palestine. There is no Israel-Palestine. There is Israel, and there is Palestine-occupied territories. Just saying Israel-Palestine, we mislead everyone. There is one sovereign place and one not. So as long as they don't have sovereignty, even if sometimes the Palestinians make a mistake by their decision on a cultural boycott, mistake what I think is wrong, maybe I thought that it could be cool that Leonard Cohen would be in Ramallah and Tel Aviv. But once they make their decision, our obligation, Leonard Cohen's obligation, my obligation is to give them the right for sovereignty, to let them lead the movement, and I will follow it. Once they have sovereignty, I'll be ready to argue with them on everything. As long as they have no sovereignty, this is my theology as Jew, to give the other to become a brother, and give the non-sovereign to be a sovereign. Thank you. Thanks, Udi. Ron Skolnick is next. Um, good evening. Um, uh, my name is Ron Skolnick. I um, uh, grew up, uh, born and raised in the U.S., though I lived um, most of my uh, adult life, and I'm a dual um, American-Israeli citizen. I guess some of what will I will say will make me a lawbreaker as well. I don't know. I don't think Israel's institutions of enforcement extend to the United States. I work for an organization uh, called Partners for Progressive Israel. I just have to clarify that we're not, uh, I wouldn't define us as an affiliate of the Merits Party in Israel. That's part of the reason we've taken on our new name. Okay. Um, one of the reasons we've taken on this new name is, is so that people would uh, stop thinking of us as a, as a direct affiliate of the Merits Party in Israel. Um, I am um, a believer in a two-state solution, and I'm against the Israeli occupation. Um, and that uh, defines um, both my work position and also my um, beliefs. Earlier this year, uh, I helped author uh, a statement uh, called, um, Buy Israel, Don't Buy Settlements, They're Not the Same. Uh, it was based on that same concept. It became um, a statement endorsed by uh, my organization's board. Um, included in that, um, because the organizers have asked us to focus a bit more on the cultural um, aspect of cultural boycott, but included um, within that, similar to what um, Jethro raised, was um, support for the actions of Israeli performers, directors, and writers who refuse to participate in performances held in any settlement beyond the Green Line, and support for Israeli university professors who refuse to teach at or have professional ties with institutions of higher education uh, in any settlements beyond the green line. Um, but our statement uh, also was in opposition to uh, a general or a global um, boycott of Israel. Um, and I'll try to explain why. Um, I, I look at boycott as um, not divorced from the eventual, the diplomats call it end game, the eventual result that we wish to accomplish. Um, I think that it's very, very important not only what we believe in the message that we think we're sending out to the community, those who agree with us, those who disagree with us, but the message that's received is probably more important how people are receiving our message than what we think we're giving out. I believe in a boycott of Israel settlements because I believe that, as a previous statement that I helped write, we need to draw a line at the green line. Um, and that's my political solution, my proposed political solution, and it's also my proposed methodology for helping to reach there. Um, 
I make no claim that we are uh, single-handedly going to um, weaken the Israeli settlement enterprise and in doing that end the settlements, but I think it is very important that we maintain the green line as a symbol uh, of an eventual two-state solution. Now, I say this because I, I don't, I honestly don't believe, and, and Udi referred to this, I know there are many people who don't uh, believe that a two-state solution is the best for the peoples of the region. Um, they think that some sort of binationalism or one state, and they don't need me to say that it's a perfectly legitimate opinion. I have no intention to boycott the opinion. And I actually think that a global BDS and a wholesale boycott of Israel, including cultural boycott, makes sense um, if, that's one's end, if that is one's end goal. I don't think it makes sense if our goal is to end the occupation of the West Bank uh, and Gaza and reach a solution along the borderlines of 1967 uh, with whatever agreements the two sides reach on swaps. Um, now, I was reading through the source material that Dali helped provide us, and I appreciate that. And I was, um, I was bothered by a couple of passages, honestly. Um, I just want to read them. Um, this is from Pac B's statement on cultural boycott. And I don't want to say that, that anybody here on the panel endorses this. I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth. But it talks about um, events and projects, such as those involving educators, psychologists, or historians involving Palestinians and or Arabs and Israelis that promote, quote, balance between the, quote, two sides in presenting their respective narratives or, quote, traumas as if on par or are otherwise based on the false premise that the colonizers and the colonized are equally responsible for the, quote, conflict are intentionally deceptive, inten intellectually dishonest, and morally reprehensible. Um, I personally ascribe to the need for dialogue and for the two sides to understand one another. I don't know which of the three, and I don't mean to be facetious, I don't know which one of the three applies. I don't think I'm morally reprehensible. Um, perhaps I'm being intellectually dishonest, but I, I, I feel that the PACB call, when it's read fully, um, there's a lot of sentiment there that doesn't include um, an Israel, a future Israel in, in it. I want to relate to the question quickly of um, cultural boycott. I think that culture is, the expression of our ideas and emotions is our most basic form of humanity. Um, I think when we boycott someone's pocketbook, someone's factory, we're um, trying to undermine their power, their ability to enjoy certain lifestyle, perhaps produce arms. I think when we're telling people that we don't want to hear their ideas or their feelings, I think we're in, a, in, a, in an area that's getting very close to dehumanization. And I think for the Jewish people, it's a particularly poignant and potent area. Again, I think it's very, very important, not only what we think we mean to say, but what others are saying to us. I I've recently been the recipient of a huge amount of hate mail of people from supporters of people in the West Bank, settlers or settlers themselves, who are telling me that I am um, I, I'm hateful of them, and I'm seeking to undermine their future welfare. I think these people legitimately feel what they're saying. I, I think that they're missing a lot, but I don't think we should ever forget the legitimacy of everyone's feelings and how they're receiving calls for boycott against them. I think a cultural boycott has to be the last and not the first, if it, even if justified, the last and not the first place we go for that reason. Um, and I have about five seconds left. Now, I just remember growing up as a boy, um, Richard Nixon, not my favorite politician, but before the opening to China um, was preceded by, by ping pong diplomacy, the idea that you break down barriers through culture and ideas. It should not be the first place that we're looking to build them up. Roy Nathanson, next. Hi. Uh, so I'm Roy Nathanson, and uh, I wrote stuff because I don't know how to do it otherwise. I'm not a policy expert, but I'm a member of Colote, and I'm a musician and poet who's identified for years with, uh, with the struggle in some way, and has some alternative views about what Jewish music is considered, and by extension, questions about the way we've been raised with a certain kind of Jewish exceptionalism. And my big experience in Israel was in acting and composing for, of all things, a German-Israeli feature film based on a book by 
uh, Aleph Beth Yahushua right after the Oslo Accords. I was in Israel for about three months playing music with, is that better? <laughs> playing music with uh, Israeli and Palestinian musicians and uh, also played the part of the father of a singing dog in a really horrible movie. <laughs> but it was an incredible time. That was an incredible time to be in Israel. And um, the shooting of Rabin and what was destroyed during that period shouldn't, shouldn't obscure the consensus that was being built. I mean, all the musicians, I was playing with musicians from all over, people there from Damascus and Amman, and we were all talking about a kind of pan-Semitic tours of the area, and it was, and, you know, it was amazing, and it felt like this, what's going on in Tahir Square now, and, and the inclusiveness of that is what I want to speak to, and the inclusiveness uh, is what I think is important about this issue of cultural boycott. And, um, I was then, but the fact is that was over. Two years later, I was asked by a friend of mine, Harold Rubin, to, who was a great avant-garde uh, clarinetist to play in a festival two years later. And because of the first intifada, I didn't want to go because I was so amazed and disappointed about what happened. And um, I've since played a lot of benefits for different kinds of peace organizations and haven't gone back to Israel, but only because a, a, a opportunity hasn't really come up, um, but I was amazed at the level of discourse in Israel and, you know, have no problem going back to Israel because, but recently I got involved in one of the big public events of the BDS program, unwittingly actually, because I play with Elvis Costello and he plays with my band and he's a very nice guy and he's, as we, uh, he's been very powerful politically and in the past, he produced the Free Nelson Mandela song, which was probably one of the most powerful political uh, pieces of music that happened in the last whatever. And uh, he called me, because I'm his Jewish friend, and <laughs> talked about the issue. And I said, he says, well, he, got the, he was booked for this gig by his normal booking agent, and now he's there, and it's this big political behind, and, 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 and people from uh, Britain called him and said, you're, you know, you're a turncoat to the, all that. And uh, I said, what should I do? I said, well, you know, I wouldn't go and play for uh, a regular uh, uh, booking agent and not do a big interview of, with Haaretz and not speak about the occupation because it's a, you know, this is like going to Northern Ireland and having, you know, but it's not South Africa. That's a whole nother thing. And so I said, you should go. Uh, under the auspices of a peace group and then try to do a gig in the West Bank. But, um, you know, I know that, that, that in some ways that's a BDS idea, in some ways it's not. But anyway, the point is, it's... <laughs> um, I, I just don't see Israel now as a situation of black and white. I mean, uh, Harold Rubin, the guy who asked me to play at the festival that I didn't go to, was one of the great uh, avant-garde clarinets from South Africa. He was fr in the ANC and was thrown out of South Africa and ended up in Israel. He's against the occupation, and he was asking me to play in the late 90s. And so it's a very complicated issue. And um, to me, art is a nonlinear way of getting at very intractable problems like this. And I agree with the UN vote. But as Israel gets more marginalized, art becomes an even more important way to build consensus. At a time when economic justice is really being looked at in a fresh way, it's particularly important to have engagement. So to get back to Elvis, he decided in the end he didn't feel comfortable playing at all. After, and then he was, of course, bombarded with unbelievable criticism. So what did this very public success of the boycott do? You know, it certainly didn't, it, it did bring attention to the, to the international concern about the occupation, but it did more to me to alienate potential supporters for real justice and a fair, fair two-state solution. I, got, I mean, of course, I got millions of calls from my relatives, but that's beside. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the thing is, after this was over, I spoke to, uh, to Ellen, and I tried to get uh, Elvis to do a benefit for uh, Rabbis for Human Rights. And if this had never happened before, I feel sure he would have done the benefit. But when he saw what a quicksand this thing is, particularly non-Jewish artists are going to be, forget about it, I'm not anywhere near this. And I think for Jewish artists, you, you know, it, it, 
not having a chance to speak to liberal Jews and to rally around a, a, a real consensus is something that we'd be missing. I mean, I'm not Pollyannish enough to think that, 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 that uh, strong ideas don't create you know, engagement. But frankly, another thing, a lot of my art was, was part of this, and other people, musicians from where I'm from, were in this radical Jewish music uh, uh, exhibition at the Jewish Museum in, uh, in Paris and in Berlin. And it, it, there's a good chance it would go to Tel Aviv. That would be a, uh, uh, something that was supported by the Israeli government. But I would want that art that discussed these kind of questions to be presented to young Jewish, to young Israelis, to, to, in, to be, allow them to engage with Palestinian youth in, in that way. And um, I, I also support absolutely a boycott of uh, uh, any kind of economic activity in the occupied territories. I think that that's a really, really important difference to be made, and I think that that could really form a real consensus. And I think just that Israeli society in general is a constantly changing landscape that should be addressed in that way, and that people actually understand that viscerally. And we have to address these questions and how to build consensus with people who understand that. Okay, that's it, thanks. And Dali Baum is last up. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. And it's a privilege to sit on the left of this table. <laughs> I was actually manipulating it a little bit to have it done. So, so um, I come from Tel Aviv. I live in Tel Aviv. I've been here now for six months on a fellowship with the Global Exchange. But usually in Tel Aviv, I teach activism, and I am an activist. And um, I want just to say a few words about the peace industry in Israel. Uh, we all want peace. We always wanted peace. I grew up singing peace songs. I was, you know, I, I was sure everybody always wanted peace, you know. I don't know why people always want to, want to kill us, but we have to defend ourselves. Um, we have no problem meeting with Palestinian youth. We've been doing it for many years. Palestinian youth live just next door. They are our neighbors. Uh, we have no problem ex being exposed to American ideas of peace and justice because, I don't know, it used to be that it was easy, now it's even easier with the internet. Um, when we talk about cultural boycott, we are not talking about cutting cultural ties or exchange of ideas. Not at all. You know, the phone is very cheap. Americans are not aware of that because you never call outside the US, I know. But <laughs> Israelis do. <laughs> it's weird, I don't know why. Um, so. What happened to me was that I got the privilege of, I don't know, going through the looking glass. I don't know, there is this thing. And there is something really weird that happened 20 minutes from where I live in Tel Aviv in the bubble. It's a completely different existence. It's a completely different uh, experience of what is Israel and what are the Palestinians and what is happening in that country and I could talk about it and read about it as much as I want but if I don't go and visit I keep forgetting even today I've not been there for six months so I, I keep forgetting and it's it's unimaginable it's unimaginable people's lives are being crushed every day it's unimaginable, the cruelty, the, you, you talk about dehumanization, the, the dehumanization every day. You know, you go, I, I take the bus half an hour, I'm in offer uh, military court in the West Bank, on the main highway to Tel Aviv, and there is a special courtroom there which is dedicated to children. And you can just come there and sit. You can just come there and sit if you can take it. If you can take it, you sit there and you see how 13-year-old, 14-year-old, 15-year-old are brought in with their orange, you know, you know, Guantanamo Bay kind clothing, and, and they are brought there to testify against people of the village that maybe told them that organized demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations against the wall or against taking their land, and they are being held there in terrible conditions for days and days and days, and they are shackled and they are tortured. And there was this, this judge who sits there who is a woman about my age, an Israeli, a Jew, of course, in uniforms, sending them to prison and back, interrogating them with all this, you know, where are we? 
I never knew I lived in that place until I was there. And then you take the bus back and you think this woman, this judge, she's here, she's my friend, she's for peace, she votes for merits. I know she is, I can tell, she's Ashkenazi, of course she does. <laughs> it's, it's unthinkable. It's unthinkable and I can stay in Tel Aviv for two, three weeks and I can forget too, it's a bubble. It's a bubble and we're even farther away from this bubble, this is much bigger here. Israel is a very small, tiny country, which means that Israelis build these huge walls of denial, you know, in concrete but also in their minds. And these are violent wars of denial that help us survive being what we are, what we're doing every day. You open this panel saying that we used to have to denounce violence and now violence is... What are you talking about? Violence is there every day. Children are being arrested in the middle of the night. People are being shot for no reason. Are we denouncing violence when we sit here? Are we taking a pledge not to support USA to Israel because it goes for guns? I mean, this is, are we denouncing violence? So, okay. I want to bring back some of the sense of urgency that I, I feel like I, I myself am losing whenever I, I'm not there. So we have to do something. We don't have all, all day, okay? We don't, we, you know, situation doesn't work for our benefit, but it's not even just a kind of discussion like that. It's, we have to do something because people are dying, okay? We have to do something. So we have a tool that works. It works. BDS works. I'll give you an example. Uh, when the Norwegian Pension Fund announced that they would divest from Elbit, a big weapons company, it was the first time ever I heard in the Israeli news that the separation wall was illegal. And I was participating in these demonstrations for three years up to then. People were getting shot at. You know, we were being trampled. You know, it was terrible just to go out in public and say, this is not right. And people here say that economic boycotts might be better than cultural boycotts. I disagree. I disagree. Cultural boycotts really don't hurt people's livelihood. You know, cultural boycotts are symbolic. They're a form of speech. They're a form of non-cooperation with the ongoing tremendous support for the state of Israel. It's our right to say, hey, we don't want to support that. We don't want to support that. It's not punishment, it's not excommunication, it's not um, a, a, some form of hatred or, 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 or censorship. It's, it does, doesn't come from governments. We're not telling people they cannot do something. We're just saying, hey, I don't want to participate in that. I don't want to participate in that. All of our biggest victories in the last two years in the BDS movement were cultural. Even those that seemed like economic victories. We didn't really hurt anybody's pockets yet. The big tycoons, by the way, Jewish Americans, that control the Israeli economy and control the Israeli polit political system have not really lost any money. What happened was that people felt like, oh my goodness, we are being uh, marginalized in the world, we are being uh, uh, kind of isolated. This is bad for business maybe in the long run. It was symbolic. When some guy told some other guy in England, I don't even remember when it was, that he doesn't want to buy this guy's parts because this is an Israeli company and doesn't want to do business with Israel, this got headline news in the Israeli economic press. It got headline news. It wasn't a big economic story, not yet anyhow, but it was about the fact that since Israel is such a small, tiny country, it is also much, much easier to influence public opinion in Israel than it was with South Africa. Much easier, you know, two newspapers, five radio stations. Israelis care about their image. Let's let them know that we do not agree with their policies. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, the binational states, one state solution, it's really not the forum to speak about it now, I think. Uh, just very important for me, for me because I love to be a Jew and I love my Palestinian brothers and sisters. I think that living together, it will be the most amazing things. And either it's two states or one state, anyway, I don't want to live in a place that I have to keep the minority minority forever. This is 
for a Jew it's unthinkable. And you know, and I don't want to be somebody that lives in a country that he can never be a president in this country. And this is the way you want to do it. So I'm happy with my binational one-state solution, but if somebody will come with a two-state solution that everyone will be equal and everyone can be moving from one place, I will go for it. I won't kill for that. But, um, but now the tolerance of the Israeli government, Israel is the most democratic state I ever seen for a white male Jew. <laughs> and I am a white male Jew. And I can say and do whatever I want in Israel, and no one will stop me. Very soon I might be stopped, but uh, things changed recently, I know. But I still like to have the dream like I am a privilege. Um, about getting money, it's very important about cultural boycott. Now I want to be serious. Uh, first, we have to have also a definition between art and culture. Culture is something that has involved much more money, business, a lot of things that art for itself doesn't do. Also, I cannot see myself, even everyone will tell me, go in the middle of a concert of Zubin Meta and scream. Because this is my taste. I just can't do it. I went, I went here to do Leonard Cohen. I tried to lift uh, something when he did the concert in New York, and I start to cry when he sang. You know, so then I wrote him a letter and explained that he shouldn't do Israel or shouldn't play Israel. And so there is also in, in boycott, we have to listen to our heart, where we are, what we are, but we have to know what is clear. We have the right to receive money from our government. The boycott allow people to get people who pay, who pay taxes to get money for their film. Unfortunately, this film, my film, that received money from the Karen after it was boycotted by all Israeli embassy and non-Jewish festivals show it here. But I still think I was privileged because it makes me feel pure. But um, the issue is also we have Palestinian citizens of Israel that have the right to receive money because they are paid taxes. And also with Oad Naharin, I think the problem was that he received money from the foreign minister as a propaganda, not that you receive money as a, as a group from Israel. But all this, the gray area of the boycott, and there are places in the boycott that are not right, doesn't change the fact that cultural boycott is a strong weapon. And you know, it's funny, it's very important that uh, the lit remind me all that. She said she forget it in uh, Tel Aviv. Maybe for me, because in the last year and a half I lived in occupied territory in Jenin and Ramallah, it's looked to me so clear that all of you know about it that I forgot and when Dalit spoke about it I start to cry again because in a way I became indifferent to it and I just if you want to understand really what is cultural boycott don't say how they give money to my movie said how the Israeli government the army kidnap my pozo when I try to do godo you know pozo in uh, waiting for godo so the soldier kidnapped him in what you call Area A, like area that uh, belonged to only Palestinians. And just, just took and took him, and for one month when we tried to put a play of people that hardly have opportunity to make theater, and they didn't release him for no reason, just that this is the meaning of occupation. It's not about the people who died in Palestine is the terrible things. It's the day-by-day -day humiliation for so long, unbearable, every day. When I cross, when I cross every, every checkpoint, I do high and the soldier do high and I go. And when my student crossed, they just took him and he disappeared for one month from the play. And after I'll speak more about the binational on one state because I really don't boycott because the wrong things they do to Palestinian citizens of Israel. I don't need to speak only of what happened in the occupied. 15 minutes, we have led Ramlan, we can speak about how they destroyed houses of Palestinians there and do ethnic cleansing within Israel territory. Whether or not we go as travelers who are thinking beings or whether we go as tourists, and in a sense, I, I thought of this from the start when I was invited to be part of this panel that, of course, many of you are not 
involved in the world of, of art necessarily, but you are people who are considering, would I go to Israel and in what sense and what identity would I go if I go to put on a, a bar mitzvah there, if I go to see the historical sites, why am I going there? What am I doing? Am I contributing to the, the culture? The culture, I thought that was in, or by contributing to the culture by spending my money there? Or if we send our children there on some kind of um, uh, Jewish mission, what is that? And the question is, do we stop them or do we say, go and speak out against these, the occupied territories? Go and speak your mind. Go and travel to Ramallah if you can. Go and watch. If you can't be in the Godot play, go watch it. And that, I think that that kind of traveling, something that, that's been um, kind of ignored, that, that people have to move through the world is very highly charged thinking um, um, cultural activists, in a sense, and even in the smallest of ways. So whether you go with your paintings or your violin or just your suitcase, I really think it's important that you go to try to activate and create change. But I feel that the discussion in the U.S. around cultural boycott is more heated than the one about economic boycott and so on, because uh, in the Jewish American community specifically, because somehow people feel that this is their cultural birthright, all the contacts with Israel, and, and it, it is intricately woven with their Jewish identity over here, the institutional connection with Israel. I, I do accept, of course, that, that cultural boycotts or any boycotts have consequences in people's lives. I don't think they are devastating consequences. I think, uh, for example, it's, it's striking that um, Udi and I, Israelis, we are here and we are calling for boycott. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, you know that this event, by the way, was sent out by a listserv of thousands of people in Israel publicizing that I'm participating in it and asking people to write to my university to, to fire me, <laughs> this event. So there are consequences to boycotts. Uh, but maybe this is also, and when we call upon boycotts, we, we are thinking, oh, these, these are manageable consequences compared to what can be done with this tool. Uh, I think this is a good way also for American Jews to think about it. There are consequences, and they are not about cutting your ties with your friend in the Haifa University. Please call us. As I said, you can call internationally. And the second remark, the second remark is about, again, the nature of this debate. We are not deciding here whether or not there is going to be a cultural boycott. This has already been decided. There is a movement. It's out there, okay? The guidelines of the movement are the PACB guidelines. We are not going to debate the guidelines. These are the guidelines. This is not a Jewish movement. This is not a Jewish American movement. It is not our movement. It is our movement, but we are just joining it. It is not our movement as in ownership. We don't get to make these decisions. We can make a decision about what we are doing when this movement is out there. We can sit here and say, hey, hey, this is terrible, terrible, terrible. Or we can join it and make it more effective. Because I think that when Jewish Americans support these boycotts, they become even more effective on the Israeli public opinion.